My name is Chris Evans. I'm an extension forester with the University of Illinois uh, Department of Natural Resources and Environmental Sciences and with the University of Illinois Extension. And today's webinar topic is the history of forest in Illinois. And what I wanted to do with this webinar really is kind of hit the highlights of the influence, historical influences that led to what we see today in Illinois in terms of our forest. Uh, what phenomenon, what influence has happened um, that kind of made our forest, and then what were the changes in the forest over time. So we're going to talk about the forest of yesterday, what brought us to where we're at today. And I broke it into three different major um, periods. So there's prehistoric influences, post-glacial influences, and then what's happened in the modern era to, to impact our forest. And then I'll end with a talk about the forest of today, where are we at? What's the diversity of our forest, the extent of our forest, kind of where is our forest um, at this point? Alrighty, so just jumping right in. Uh, to start with, we're going to talk about the prehistoric influences um, of, the, of the forest. And with that, I'm talking about um, mostly climatic changes, uh, geological influences, kind of that set the base for um, um, for driving our forest in the direction that they are today. And to start that, we're going to go all the way back to 70-some um, million years ago, um, back when a very warm period, high sea levels, much of southern Illinois at that point in time uh, was oceanfront property. Uh, the Gulf of Mexico made its way much farther north into um, what's, what was called the Mississippi Embayment. And um, that sea level or that bay or that gulf made its way all the way into much of southern Illinois and then remained here for a long period of time. And, and that led to large sand deposits, um, coral development, large limestone deposits. And so um, once the, the oceans retreated, sea levels um, dropped, uh, over time, those deposits kind of formed a lot of our uh, geology in Southern Illinois. And that's why we have sandstone, limestone here, and it, it developed our topography as well. And so you see uh, what was ancient, you know, beach property or, or sea level or sea floor property uh, in sand is now our, our sandstone bluffs. Um, and we get a lot of our topography from that, um, a lot of our geology based here. And this is where a lot of the forest in Illinois are at now. And it also um, created areas where there's flat, um, swampy areas as well, kind of back from this embayment is, um, time. And so those influences are in southern Illinois. For much of the rest of the state, um, very different. Uh, the major kind of prehistoric um, influence really uh, was glaciers. And so Illinois has experienced multiple uh, glacial episodes, uh, the most recent being the Wisconsin glaciation that was anywhere from 25 and lasted about 12,000 years ago. And that really influenced the uh, kind of northeastern quadrant of the state. And glaciers, um, really these are continental ice sheets moving. They are, uh, in Illinois, it was anywhere from 500 to 1,000 feet thick of ice. And so these glaciers really kind of hit the reset button on on the, the the landscape scouring it removing all plant life um, changing the topography flattening it and then depositing a lot of what we call glacial till which is ground up loose aggregate rocks um, the other thing that these glaciers did other than just sitting uh, hitting the reset buttoning and changing and removing kind of everything that was here previous was it, it influenced the climate drastically having this ma massive amount of ice on the landscape, um, even when it receded, the the climate was different. The conditions were were very different, and so we found um, in Illinois at this time, and as much of uh, the country, much of the eastern part of the country, uh, the 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 climate was colder, was wetter. Uh, the ice sheets retreating allowed for a very very cold, wet climate, kind of adjacent to the ice sheets, and so in this environment really at this point in time, the forest of Illinois were much more similar to the northern forest, what we see in, in parts of Canada now, which was, um, you know, cold spruce forest, um, wet sedge meadows, and these things. 
And then even after it receded and the glaciers moved out of Illinois, this habitat remained. It was still cold, wet climate. And so at this time, if you were in our state, you know, you would have seen um, sites more like this. Wet sedge meadows, spruce forest um, out on the landscape, um, cold climates. And this was the era uh, in of the megafauna at this time, mastodons, uh, ground sloths, things like that. Um, it's interesting to find, like, if you talk to some archaeologists in the state, there's a lot of um, fossils found of mastodons and, and different uh, different uh, ones of these of these megafauna kind of across the state, which is was fascinating. So this this is the air at this point in time. I like the description here that you see written. Uh, it says, as the glaciers receded, pioneering tundra vegetation was replaced with spruce forest and sedge-dominated wetlands. Grasses and scattered trees were present in the uplands, uh, largely white and black spruce. And so this really was the, the habitat that we saw in Illinois for a long period of time. Following uh, this, we kind of move into this post-glacier. So after the glaciers completely receded, they're off of the landscape. Um, we had a period then of this cold, wet, you know, wet spruce forest, and then it gradually transitioned. And so eight to 12,000 years ago, there was a, a drying and a warming period. And so the, the climate shifted, we had much warmer temperatures, and then we started experiencing, particularly around that 8,000 years ago, um, kind of almost a super drought. And so this warmer, drier conditions um, pushed out and became unsuitable for these uh, sedge for, uh, spruce forest. And really this is where we started to see um, the development of deciduous forest in Illinois was at this period of time. And really uh, it's where we see oaks getting on the landscape for the first time and becoming the dominant force in our forest. This was kind of the start of what we see today was this period of 12 to 8,000 years ago was kind of the, the beginning of our development of our oak ecosystems that we have across the state. Um, at the same time of this drying, this warming uh, period, uh, the start of the deciduous forest, this is also around the same time that humans first showed up uh, in Illinois at this time. And with them, uh, fire came along. And you'll see that the fire and the presence of humans has a drastic influence um, on kind of how our forest developed over time. And so this, this super drought, this drying period, the other thing that happened with it is um, it extended the, um, the grasslands. Previous to this, grasslands were kind of restricted to the rain shadow on the east side of the Rocky Mountains. The super drought, these very dry conditions, pushed grasslands much farther east and throughout Illinois. And this was the development of our tall grass prairies. This is why we have prairie all the way into Ohio and parts of Kentucky was these drought conditions and the, the push east along with the anthropogenic use of fire. And so Illinois at this time, you know, we're shifting to oak dominated forest, um, deciduous forest, as well as we're seeing the arrival of tall grass prairie uh, ecosystems into Illinois. And what that yielded in our state was a shifting mosaic. And so we had prairie, um, all the way from prairie to the close forest in the state, and then all the transitions, you know, prairie to savanna to open woodland to closed forest. And the important thing to think, uh, to realize about this, is this was not a static situation. There wasn't prairie at one site and it was always prairie, and then another site there was forest and there was always forest. The idea behind a shifting mosaic is small changes in climate, small changes in the use of fire, um, let these systems kind of interact with each other and move back and forth across the landscape, sometimes shifting miles, you know, over the hundreds of years and then moving back. And so any one part, one parcel of land in Illinois could have experienced all these different ecosystems over this time period um, as the lines between them move and shift over time. And so we had everything in Illinois at this time, open prairie, uh, savanna, oak savanna, which is prairie with widely spaced open grown trees, um, more of open woodlands, which still had a lot of light component, and then more closed dark forests, kind of all together in these ecosystems intermingled across the state. Um, this 
continued on and then uh, from anywhere from five to about 3,500 years ago, uh, there was another shift in the climate. And so we kind of lost that super drought at this time. And our climate uh, shifted to more of an increase in moisture, increase in humidity, higher levels of rainfall. And these higher levels of rainfall are more conducive to forest development. Um, we saw a bit more reforestation on the landscape. The oak forests um, that, that has been here um, since about 12,000 years ago, developed about 12,000 years ago, um, started expanding on the landscape. But it didn't cover the entire state, even though the, the climate was conducive for forest covering everywhere. From 3,500 3, years on, uh, we really maintained our prairies, our savannas, our open ecosystems, largely as a result of anthropogenic use of fire. Um, Illinois at that, point, at that point in time had a lot of um, humans on the landscape. They were using fire and we, um, there's estimates that any one parcel of land burned at this point in time, you know, anywhere from every year, every two years to every five or six years. Um, and even though our climate was pushing us towards forest, our prairies, our savannas stayed on the landscape largely because of fire. And so we find fire uh, developed our ecosystems really anywhere from 12,000 years ago on, uh, particularly from that 5,000 to 3,500 years uh, ago, um, fire was crucial to the development of our ecosystems. And really this is where the community, the plant communities we see today, the forests we see today, really were cemented ecologically at this point in time. And that's where we see the, um, our, what we consider our modern uh, ecosystems in Illinois really forming, really um, um, getting established on the landscape was this time period. And so with fire moving here, we still had our shifting ecosystems. We still had forests, prairies, savannas, kind of all throughout the landscape. Um, and that really moves us into the modern era. And so this is what we had um, continued on really until um, kind of European settlement and the first European settlers moved into um, into Illinois. And so when they sh first showed up, the first settlers moved in, um, our best estimate is in Illinois, we had uh, about 13.8 million acres of forest, which covered about 37% of the land area. Now this forest was concentrated in several spots, the unglaciated areas of Northwestern Illinois uh, and Southern Illinois was kind of the strongholds of our, of our forest as well as river bottoms uh, throughout much of the rest of the state. But again, um, this is still a snapshot, even though at that point in time, there was 37% of the land area of the state was forest. Um, it still, um, this still was kind of a snapshot of a shifting mosaic. It was still moving, um, changing with climate conditions or, or, or people's use as, as well. So it wasn't a static system. It was, uh, we showed up and took a snapshot of a more dynamic moving system. Now, when uh, the Europeans first show, settlers first showed up on the landscape, that's when we saw drastic changes um, to our ecosystems and drastic directional changes to the development of our forest. Um, there actually was a drastic increase in fire frequency initially. And so fires were put on the landscape every year, high intensity fires, largely uh, early settlers were using fires for land clearing, um, for agricultural clearing, different things like that. So we had a lot of, of fire initially. Uh, we saw large scale land clearing and, and conversion to agriculture at this time, both in our prairies, uh, our savannas and our forested ecosystems. And then a lot of this land clearing and cutting of our forest initially was uh, to meet a high demand for wood as a fuel, as a construction resource, as well as just land clearing to convert to agriculture. And so you can find uh, on this point in time, um, we had a lot of, of fuel needs and, and wood was a major fuel source, whether it was to drive our, um, our boat traffic, our steam traffic that used wood as a, a major heating source, um, for construction source, you see a stave mill here down in Southern Illinois. Um, there was a lot of needs and so forests were being cut at this time um, heavily. The other thing we had in portions of Illinois was an iron industry. And so if you know, this is an old iron furnace right here. And these um, 
furnace, you, you use charcoal, charcoal made from wood to smelt the iron. And there was some estimates that um, like just one iron furnace that was running at capacity. I think this one here, which is in Hardin, Hardin County, those estimate that it took uh, 7,000 acres or something like that of land cleared uh, to get enough wood to run this, uh, to run this uh, iron furnace as it was operating. So there was a heavy, heavy fuel demand for the, the iron industry when it was here as well. And so all this led to, again, large scale clearing of our forest, utilization of our forest, which obviously had an influence on um, kind of how things developed. And this period culminated in what I call the great cutover. And so from the 1880s to the 1920s in Illinois, the vast majority, almost all of our forests uh, were severely logged or clear cut at this point in time. So this was kind of the nadir of our forest, the low point in the amount of forest we have in the state. And so we saw a large reduction in the uh, forest cover in the state from um, what we think was pre pre settlement. Uh, and so there's an estimate that we lost about 10 million acres of forest at this point in time. Um, we saw this again, a lot of agriculture uh, uses, a lot of land clearing. And then uh, things changed really uh, following this great cutover. Uh, we saw in a lot large parts of Illinois, particularly on areas that had, um, that were farming was happening on marginal soils or highly erodible soils. Um, we saw large-scale land abandonment following this in the Depression era, the Dust Bowl era. Uh, we had a lot of farms failing, a lot of farms um, dropping out, especially again in those marginal soils. And so following this in the 30s and the 40s, we saw a lot of reforestation. And a lot of that was accidental reforestation or just passive reforestation where land was no longer used for agriculture and it was allowed to um, just reforest itself naturally. And some of it was more active reforestation where we had um, you know tree plantings through groups like the CCC program and where they planted trees to kind of halt this erosion and so at this point in time this is where we started to see the reforestation of Illinois and and after this great cutover um, the trees coming back and really our forest we see today most of the trees the mature trees you see on the landscape um, were started at this point in time so this is our, our the, the actual trees we have today, um, kind of can you, most of them date back to this period in time. Most of the forests date back to this period in time. Following this, uh, we took a different view of forest. Uh, Smokey the bear kind of came on the landscape. Um, the, the use of fire changed, whether it was the old anthropogenic um, early settlers using fire really, really heavily, suddenly fire became uh, a negative thing in our forests. Uh, as, forest were re as forest were reclaiming the land, regrowing, um, they largely did this in absence of fire in many places. Uh, if wildfires started uh, or if other fires uh, were found on the landscape, they were quickly put out. Um, we had fire towers getting put up across the state. Uh, people paid to watch for these um, these escapes, fires, and wildfires, and then actively put out. Fire suddenly became a negative thing in our forest at this point in time. And as these forests were regrowing um, following the Great Cutover, it really um, influenced and changed how they developed and what they ended up looking like. So this fire suppression influenced the regrowth of the forest and it also impacted the existing forests that were on the landscape. And so most of our forest before this was more of that mosaic anywhere from uh, open savanna, open woodland into closed forest. At this point in time, largely much of our forest started closing in. And so we didn't have these open ecosystem, these open forested ecosystems. Um, our forest started closing in, becoming more uh, dark, more shaded, more of a, a, a closed canopy style forest. And it also, the fire suppression led to closing in of our of our other open, open ecosystems, our prairies, our open savannas. And so we found, particularly in our forest, um, our, you know, pre-cutover forest were more, uh, a lot of them, especially in the uplands, were more open ecosystems that had a lot of uh, a more developed vegetative component in the understory. 
with uh, widely spaced trees. Uh, these were maintained a lot by fire. In the absence of fire, uh, we said this slow closing in of our forest and more shaded environments. And the more shaded environments allowed um, more humidity and also allowed more um, the shift in the species. So oaks, uh, which was historically the dominant group of species in our systems, um, are fairly shade intolerant or somewhat shade intolerant and cannot um, thrive in these systems. So a more closed system favored more shade tolerant species. And so we're seeing the shift uh, in what species can grow in our ecosystems kind of over time, largely due to these, uh, the, to the suppression of, of, of fire in these ecosystems. And so we find a lot of ecosystems, a lot of our forest ecosystems in Illinois look just like this. And we have an overstory that started in the 20s to 30s to 40s um, of these uh, oaks, hickories um, species. They're still dominant, they're long-lived species, so they're still on the landscape. But then we have this anywhere from 80 to 40 to 80 year old mid story of these what we call mesophytic species. And so a lot of those are maples, beech, and things like that. And so this is a very common site, a very common condition we find a lot of our forest in now is, um, is this dominant mid-story of, of more mesophytic shade tolerant species, whether it's maple or beech uh, or other species like that. And so that's um, kind of the one, probably the biggest modern era influence following um, the great cutover is the, the lack of fire that we see in our landscape. The other thing we've had is um, really the introduction of invasive species, exotic species that are not naturally found in these ecosystems and they don't have a lot of natural enemies. Um, just one example here is, is bush honeysuckle and you see really nothing growing under it. And so it takes that um, the idea of casting shade and adding shade to an ecosystem uh, to the extreme level uh, the same thing with uh, common buckthorn here. So those big changes uh, due to these exotic species kind of getting in our landscape and, and, and adding and entering our communities. And then other invasives have changed our forest that we see today. Uh, invasive insects like emerald ash borer that are actively changing what species are on the landscape. Um, there's other influences in the past. Uh, chestnut blight, dogwood anthracnose, butternut canker. These have just shifted our species that we see on the landscape. And, and we're finding now with emerald ash borer, it's you know moved all the way across uh, the state, unfortunately. And so that's just another invasive influence that we have on the landscape. The other big influence that we see today is really our past management. Our choices of how we've handled our forest, how we've managed our forest in the past, obviously influence greatly what our forests look like today. And I have this picture um, as a great example of past management. So the, the picture you see here, if you can see on the landscape, it's largely uh, sugar maples and black cherry. This is a site actually that was um, a, a white oak site, had a lot of oaks on this, on this site. It was a south facing slope, it was a great white oak site, but it was cut um, and managed in a way that did not, did not support the continuation of oaks on the system. It, was, it wasn't managed right, it was just clear cut and then without, uh, without managing for regeneration of these species. And so we saw that um, the past management choices on this forest directly led to a complete shift away from oaks to an entirely different ecosystem. So in our past management, um, across the whole, the whole, any forest across the state, you know, is involved usually two to three at least entries where people have logged, um, depending on how hard they've logged and, and whether they've grazed it, all these different influences um, impact what grows there today. And it's hard to find an acre of forest in Illinois that hasn't been grazed or cut over multiple times. And so those, those have influenced where we see it today. And the other thing that's happening, of course, is just um, population increases, other land uses. There's a high demand still for land for agriculture, land for development, and that's influencing currently where our forests are, uh, what our forest looks like, our fragmentation of our forest. And so there's a lot of these kind of modern influences 
that are impacting our, our forest on the landscape. So the question comes from that is after all these things, we have the historic influences, um, the development, the droughts moving into our oak ecosystems, and then largely the last couple hundred years, uh, the more modern influences. Where are we at with our forest now? What does our forest look like giving all this history, all these different influences that are happening, that have happened to our forest? And so I'll, I'll spend the next bit of time really talking about that. What are the extent, the locations, of what does our forest look like in the state now? And so you saw this, the, the one on the left earlier that we think uh, about the time of uh, the first European settlers arriving, we had around 37% of our land area as forest, uh, just a shade under 14 million acres. Currently, uh, our last estimate was in 2015 is that we have about almost 5 million acres of forest in the state. And that's about 14% of our land area. So it's a drastic change from, um, from historically. And it, 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 this looks bad, right? It looks like we've lost so much forest. We're down to 5 million from 14 million, but it doesn't take into account the whole story when in fact, actually this is um, growing forest. So we went down, uh, the low point was somewhere below 3 million acres. And in the last hundred years or so, we've actually grown about 2 million acres of forest across the state. So if you look at some of the data, even from 1945 till now, We've added um, right at a million acres of forest in the state. So we're actively growing the forests, uh, regrowing forests in an area. Again, some of this is passive just with land abandonment. Uh, some of it is active with reforestation projects through things like uh, the CRP programs, through DNR's FDA uh, program that are actively putting forest back on the landscape. So both kind of both things are happening at the same time. At the same time, our forest, even though we're adding new forest, we're growing new forest, our existing forests are aging. And so this graph kind of shows the, the distribution of age classes of forest across the state from the, um, the late 90s till now. And it's kind of confusing at first, but the big things I want you to focus on, one is um, that kind of mid-aged forest, 20 to 40 year old forest is actually decreasing. So we're, we're growing forest, but we're not um, growing them super fast. We're not getting a lot of that new young forest. So our, our young forests are decreasing over time. At the same time, our older forests are increasing. So our forests are aging. We're not doing as much logging. We're not doing as much um, active um, kind of timber management of our forest. And so the average age of our forest, the, age, uh, the, the stand age class, we call it, are, are growing up. So we're getting more and more of that 60 year old and older forest as time goes on and less of that under 40 year old forest. Forest across the, the state is largely in private landowners. We do have some major um, public landowners like the Department of Natural Resources and the US Forest Service, but by and large, our forests in the state are held by our private landowners. And so looking at it, um, just kind of a summary of, of what the, the snapshot of the forest today, we actually have increasing forest acres uh, across Illinois. We've added uh, a couple a couple million acres in the last hundred years. We're up to about five million acres, which is about 14% of the state. We have an aging forest, which about half of our forests now in the state are older than 60 years old. And we have forests that are largely in the hands of private forest landowners. So over three quarters of our forests in the state are privately owned. Um, the forest in Illinois, what we see is really a mix. So about two thirds of the state, um, two thirds of our forests are still in that oak hickory forest type, what we consider our upland forest. Um, this is the one that most people are, are familiar with. So 68% of our forest we consider um, kind of upland oak hickory forest type. And then about a quarter of our forest um, fall into this elm ash cottonwood forest. And so these are our big bottomland forests that we see along our major rivers ecosystems along the Mississippi, parts of the Ohio. Um, so those are our two major dominant forest types in the state. Um, there's bottomland forest and then our, uh, that are cottonwood forest, ash forest, and then our upland oak hickory forest. 
our force in the state actually are very, very diverse. Even with all these different influences, we have an amazing amount of species that occur in our forest, amazing amount of animals that utilize our forest. And when I first moved to Illinois uh, 13 or 14 years ago now, I uh, was blown away by the diversity that I found um, across the state. Uh, we have about 180 species of trees or shrubs that are native to Illinois. Uh, that includes 20 different oak species, 10 different hickory species. Um, again, just amazing diversity of woody species that, that call Illinois home. And if you can go on the landscape and just with oaks, you can uh, be overwhelmed with the number of oaks that you can see on the landscape and how many different species you can find. Um, so just so you know, these are, we have eight different species of white oaks, 12 different species of red oaks. Um, that can be found across the landscape. Again, just amazing diversity. And uh, largely this um, huge diversity of our forest, the number of species we find in the state um, is due partly just to our location on the landscape. This is a map here of kind of the major physiographic regions of the United States. You can see much of Illinois falls into that, um, the, the, the Grand Prairie, what they call the Central Lowland here, but the, the, the one ecosystem. If you get to Southern Illinois, which is really where a heart of a lot of the diversity, tree diversity in the state is, you can see it's a point where there's four of these major physiographic regions meet together in one location. That's pretty rare on the landscape. If you look across, there's not many places in the United States where we have four major physiographic regions meeting. And what that, that creates is a transition zone or any kind of ecotone area in the southern part of the state where you get influences from all these ecosystems. You have southern influences coming up, coastal plain influences, Ozarkian influences, the northern forest that we see across the rest of the state, as well as even Appalachian influences coming from the east. And so it kind of becomes a melting pot of different tree species, different uh, plant species, animal species that are all found together in one location um, because of the, the, the proximity of all these different major um, physiographic regions joining together. The other thing you have is really a lot of geologic diversity in the state. We talked about uh, the glacial history and laying down all the glacial till and changing a lot of the, the northern part of the state. The sandstone and limestone influences in the southern part of the state. We also have Ozarkian chert and um, luss on the western part of the state and then the major river bottoms cutting through. And so Illinois, geologically speaking, is a very diverse state. Topographically speaking, is a very diverse state. And then just latitudinally from the north to the south, we go through quite a few different growing zones and that influences what can grow here and what can't. So there's a lot of diversity in the state um, if you look at it in multiple ways. And this just lends itself and creates opportunity for plant diversity, ecosystem diversity. So in the state, you can find anywhere, uh, uh, all these different ecosystems kind of sometimes in close proximity to themselves. And I like adding this picture because I always try to sneak pictures of my kids into talks. But you can find, you know, true southern hard uh, deep water swamps, cypress tupelo swamps in the state, um, all the way from that to upland, um, you know, mesic forest into these dry open, uh, oak, open oak woodlands, glades and savannas, all the way to the dry, rocky kind of Ozarkian stuff. And all this is found across the state. Again, because of that geologic diversity, that latitudinal gradient we have, and then that um, just kind of the history we have in the state allows us to have all these different ecosystems um, in our forested areas in the state. And so this creates, again, this huge diversity. And we have a lot of unusual trees in the state, a lot of neat trees. I'm throwing a few here just because I like their names and their unusual species. And a lot of people maybe not realize that these are native species to Illinois. So we have everything from overcup oak, which is a real wetland species um, where the cap almost completely encircles the acorn. Again, we have that bald cypress here. We have funny, uh, name things like farkleberry, which is one of our tree size blueberries that occur in the state. Uh, we have species like black gum, woolly bumelia, which is a, a fascinating species that occurs kind of right at the edge of hill prairies along the western edge of the state. Um, 
other ones like big leaf snowbell bush, just really a fascinating diversity of trees. Yellowwood and cucumber trees, which are really Appalachian species, you would expect to find those if you go into the Smoky Mountains. We have them occurring in the state. And then some really wild species and probably one of my favorite names of any species you find, woody species you find in the state, is Devil's Walking Stick. Uh, Devil's Walking Stick, uh, if you're not familiar with it, it's a small tree. It gets up to three or four inches in diameter, but the whole thing looks like that picture. Just spiny, thorny throughout the whole thing. Even the leaves are thorny. Um, they call it Devil's Walking Stick, one, because it tends to have a single shoot that comes up and it's about the size of a walking stick. But to me, I think it gets that name because it's tendency to grow right on the shoulder of a hill. So if you're walking up a hill, you're trying to make your way up the hill, you're getting tired. By the time you get to the top of that hill, you're reaching out and you're grabbing vegetation to help pull yourself up a steep hill. Right when you get to the top, that's where this plant's growing. And many times I've um, done this and reached out and tried to grab a plant to help me pull myself up a, a hill. And I grab one of these devil walking sticks. And that's usually when you end up saying a few choice words, therefore it's named devil's walking stick. Um, so again, lots of different tree species out there on the landscape. And so to summarize, um, you know, our forest in the state really are incredibly diverse. Um, they've regrown following this great cutover, um, but we still maintained our, a lot of our tree species, a lot of our diverse species. And then largely in our state, uh, most of our forests, particularly our upland forests, are still dominated by these oak hickory forests, uh, oak hickories in the overstory. Um, and these forests were formed from a lot of varying influences um, from the climate, the changing climate, our geologic history, our glacial, glacial history, our geographic location on the, on the, in the country, as well as a major component to forming our forest are humans, our past management, our use of forests, our, um, the, the use and non-use of fire has influenced what we see on the landscape. And so our forest, again, shifted all the way from um, spruce forests, sedge meadows, uh, following glaciation, and then transition into these oak ecosystems. And now we're seeing oak ecosystems, but a closing in and a shift towards more uh, mesic species back to maple uh, uh, ecosystems, kind of moving that way right now without management. And so that's... Um, a, a real quick kind of summary of what we're seeing on the landscape and how our forests have changed over time. I wanted to make sure that I left plenty of time for questions uh, for anybody that has anything. So what I'll do now is open it up and if anybody is uh, has any questions, put them into the chat box and we'll address them as we go along. Thanks, Chris. Um, we've had a lot of really good questions uh, already come up in the chat box, so we'll go ahead and, and jump right into this. Um, first question, any sense of how acorns got here? This was back when you were talking about uh, Pleistocene changes. Uh no, you know, I don't know. I think this was a long uh, shift. It wasn't like an all of a sudden Oak, uh, oak trees were across the whole state. You know, the, the, the changes are hundreds of years or even thousands of years that to develop these. And I'm guessing the oaks were always on the landscape. Um, they were um, farther away from, you know, the, uh, the, the glacial influences. And so I think over the, the years as the glaciers receded and the climate changed, um, oaks migrated. They moved out of farther south, moved up from drier areas where they had developed or where they were established, and then slowly moved along the landscape as the, the habitat became more suitable for them. So this was, this is a long process that takes so much longer than, than we, in our, in our kind of our view and our time frame can, can even see necessarily. So I think it's, they moved in um, slowly over time. Okay, uh, next question. What are some differences that we're seeing in the forests that experienced active versus natural reforestation? That's a good question. Um, so a lot of the, originally back in the era following the great cutover, a lot of the active reforestation at that point in time 
was um, a lot of uh, pines, a lot, you know, and things like that. So we had a lot of pines put on the landscape when historically we didn't have a lot of pines in the state. So much of our, our, our pine forest was here across the state kind of was a part of that active reforestation. Um, the rest of it, it depends, you know, a lot of active reforestation historically were monocultures and that's because we didn't understand necessarily the need for diversity. So we had one or two species that were planted across the entire area. Um, whereas in more of a natural reforestation, you would have what was found in the area, what came up naturally through stump sprouting or, or seed banking or moved in from adjacent forest. So historically, I would say that those uh, active reforestation sites probably had lower diversity, had higher um, kind of higher tree numbers. Um, nowadays, active reforestation uh, is a lot different. So the people value diversity more, they kind of understand the need for it. And so reforestation actions at this time put a lot more species in and things. Okay. Um, what did the change in the number of herbivores and rooting animals, uh, such as wild boars, et cetera, do to the post-European settlement landscape? Uh, that's a good question. Um, so at the same time as the, Euro as the Europeans came on the landscape, again, they did a lot of cutover, they did that, but also we saw a huge drop in the amount of herbivores on the landscape. We lost a lot of the deer. Um, they were largely extirpated. Buffalo or bison were largely extirpated, extirpated. And so we didn't have that browsing influence, that grazing influence. And so I would imagine that um, those heavy deer numbers or the normal deer numbers would have kind of helped thin some of the seedlings out, would have driven less palatable species to grow more. And in the absence of that, um, I'm sure that different species came up. I'm, I don't know exactly which ones, but I think the lack of herbivores at first was probably more of an influence than wild boar or other things on the landscape. Um, a, lot, a lot of times deer, uh, which are browsers, were replaced by cattle. And, you know, as people grazed forest and cattle are more of a grazer, feed on herbaceous vegetation versus deer, which feed a lot on woody vegetation. So you had different selection pressures. Okay, thanks. Um, where would chestnut have been in Illinois? So that's a great question. So chestnut, we are kind of right at the edge of American chestnut in the state uh, in the country, and so the best thoughts are chestnut historically naturally came into just the southern edge of the state, uh, in a couple southern counties. Um, and that's where it, it, the extent of it naturally was. Now it had been moved around and planted in other areas of the state and we find chestnut in other areas too, but historically it was just that, um, those southern tiers along the Ohio River, which is where we see a lot of these Appalachian species kind of finding um, their home in, in the state. Okay. Uh, the next question had a couple people uh, ask it and another related question, so I'll pair them up. How does climate change affect our forests and how does that affect our management and restoration of forests? Um, that's a good question. You know, we, we, uh, we talked about how shifting climates have influenced what species can grow here, what species can't, and as the glaciers receded, the climate shifted. Um, similar influences that are happening today with our shifting climate. It's going to influence what can grow here, what species do well here, their competitive advantages. And so um, the difference now is that our climate is shifting at a faster rate than it did historically. And so we talked about oaks slowly moving onto the landscape as the habitat became suitable. Um, the worry here is that the climate's going to shift faster than the plants uh, can adapt or can move and can, and can move into an area. And so the, the worry is that will um, these tree species, these plant species will be walked out of their suitable habitat as the, as the, as the climate changes underneath of them. And so the, the thing that we can do and there's different, there's different thoughts about that. Some people are considering what's called assisted migration which is uh, 
is basically moving plants faster than they can move themselves. And so the idea would be if you're reforesting in, in northern Illinois, you should plant some uh, genetic material from southern Illinois up there now. So in 50 years as those trees mature, they'll be more adapted to that climate. And for southern Illinois, it would be getting species from, or not species, but genetic material from Tennessee and moving it up a portion of it. Um, that's one take. The other take is um, the best way to adapt to climate change is to maintain as much diversity and health as we can. Um, so if we have all of our pieces of our ecosystem, all the trees, all the plant species here and thriving, um, they're going to be able to better adapt than if they're stressed um, from other, you know, management issues and things like that. So maintaining healthy, diverse ecosystems will provide as much resiliency as we can. I'm not sure which one I best fall in, but I, I think probably both of those are good strategies to consider. Okay. Um, what is the ideal acreage of forests in Illinois? Where do we want to be? Well, as a forester, I would say as much forest as we can, but uh, uh, no, I don't think there's an ideal. You know, uh, we want we want enough forest. We want enough large forest blocks to um, to provide habitat and, uh, for our our plant species, our animal species. Uh, but I, I can't say there's an ideal situation. You know, again, most of our forests are privately private uh, privately owned, and so that question is going to be up to each landowner to decide how much forest they want. Ideally, with me, we want enough to maintain. Um, to maintain our, our diversity, our species that are here. I can't put a number on that necessarily. I mean, you could say 30 some percent, but again, this is a shifting forest. Uh, it was a sh it's a shifting system throughout the history in Illinois that went up higher levels of forest, lower level forest, depending on the, the climate and the conditions. So it's hard to put a concrete number on that. Okay. Um... Do we have any old growth forest in Illinois at all? Cypress in southern Illinois? Um, that's a good question and uh, it's a tricky one to answer because there's old growth trees and there's old growth forest. We have many, many, many examples of trees that predate European settlement. Uh, they're across the landscape. If you're looking at a forest and it, like a block of forest, that has never had um, any kind of influence of logging, cutting, grazing, anything like that that's influenced that forest, I would say that we, we pretty much don't. Uh, there are some areas, you know, Bell Woods along the Wabash is one great, great example that has an abundance of very old, large trees. I would argue that that probably still doesn't qualify as an old growth forest in the sense that it's still had a lot of human influences on it. Um, so, in, in, in my take is that no, we don't have old growth forests, though we have a lot of old trees. All right. And uh, next, why use the term aging rather than maturity? Um, are you not referring to ecological succession or something else? Oh, when I talked about an aging for forest? Um, yeah, I think when you talk about maturity, maturity is a term I use um, for a tree when it becomes mature in the sense that it's sexually reproductive. It's it's uh, at that point aging, and that point just means that our it's it's not a tree, but it's an entire forest, and it's simply the average age of those forests or the, the, the when they were created. It's a term that's often used to describe um, kind of uh, the average age or or how old a forest is instead of an individual. Okay, and a related question. Um, hold on a second. Uh, is an aging forest a good thing? Yeah, no, it is. Um, I think aging forest is a fine thing. Um, the one worry about that and the kind of the the point I wanted to make of that slide is that our forests are getting older. We're getting older forests on the landscape. That's a good thing but we're also not getting uh, a lot of that younger forest. And if you look at ecologically speaking in terms of 
the, the suite of animals that utilize forest, it's a different suite of species that use older forest than younger forest. Um, it's different groups of plants, different groups of animals. And so we look at our, our animal species, particularly in the state that are kind of in most need of conservation help that are declining. Largely, it's that suite of species that utilize young developing forest. And so that's an ecosystem that is um, not on the landscape in big numbers right now. So things like, you know, redheaded woodpeckers, um, chats, some of these other, some of the uh, prairie warblers, things like that, that utilize kind of shrubby environments, developing forest, uh, even rough grouse, which we used to have in the state, we don't have anymore. That ecosystem or that component of forest is what is um, most lacking in the state right now. So it wasn't saying that older forests are a bad thing. I think that's a good thing. It's just, I like to have, to see that curve kind of encompass all aspects of, of the forest from young to old. Okay. Uh, who would be, or what would be an example of a privately owned forest? Uh, oh, great example. Um, that's a good question. So it's any forest that is owned by a, a landowner. So it could be a 40 acre woodlot in the back of a farmer's land. It could be somebody, a landowner that has five acres attached to their, uh, their home that they love just to roam on. It could be a thousand acre hunt club that um, people join together to deer hunt on. It's basically any forest that is not in uh, government ownership or industry ownership. Okay. Are we supporting private landowners in managing their forests? If so, how? That's a really good question. So uh, there's a lot of initiatives to help with that. So in the state, we have what's called the Forestry Development Act program, and that's ran by the Illinois Department of Natural Resources. And so that program incentivizes and uh, landowners to get a plan to help manage their forest, has opportunities for cost share to help manage their forest. Uh, the NRCS, which is a federal a agency, uh, Natural Resource Conservation Service, they have programs to help landowners manage their forest. There's whole suites of private consulting foresters out there that can help. Um, overall, I would say that um, the majority of our forests in the state are not actively managed or are not managed very well. If you just come in and, and cut your forest every 40 years and don't think about it in between, you're not actively managing your forest. So I would love to see um, more forests be actively managed to maintain our diversity, to provide um, you know timber, opportunities that are um, kind of in the context of a healthy forest management system. So I would love to see that more. Uh, we do have systems in place, um, but again, it could always be more. Okay. Are privately owned forests vulnerable to destruction because their owners might sell them for the wood or land development, et cetera? Uh, yeah, they are, I'm sure. So uh, again, the way we have set up is forest are the decisions made on that land are the landowners. And if they want to um, manage the forest one way or clear it um, larger, they can. And um, again, timbering and logging is not necessarily a bad thing to the forest, especially when it's done in a healthy way. Um, so my take is landowners should be managing their forest and can get timber on their forest, but they should do it within the context of a management plan. But really the, the biggest thing we can do is educate landowners the value of their forest, the role their forests play across the state, and the benefits that they as landowners see to a well-maintained, well-managed forest. And through that education, we had hoped that more forest across the state, more private forests are um, well-maintained and well-managed. Okay. Um, this next question was a little more of a statement, but um, this person thought beech maple forests were climax forests, and I assume they're asking about um, managing for oak hickory versus beech maple. Yeah, you know, and the idea behind a climax forest, that's a that was a concept that was de that was um, developed in, in ecology that really people are moving away from right now. And the idea behind that is that these systems move from open, you know, and develop and end up in some kind of end state. And that's where they're going to be. And um, 
we're seeing now that that's um, not what we saw on the landscape here. It wasn't a general move to some kind of end point. Instead, our forests here were developed over time kind of in the presence of disturbance, in the presence of um, fire and, and other influences. And so our ecosystems developed and, and communities developed and built for, right now we're looking at 10,000 years without ever moving to what, uh, what you could call a climax system. And so in, this, in that case, that's not really kind of how we look at our forest in the state and especially kind of historically how our forest behaved in the state. It was more of a dynamic system that was moving in, in directions, different directions depending on the, the, the influences that happened to them. Okay. Um, how can we help Illinois forests when we are urban property owners? Uh, it's a good question. Uh, definitely a good question. You know, and it's still even in an urban situation, there's um, nature preserves, there's uh, forest preserve districts. And so volunteering, becoming a site steward, something like that to help manage uh, publicly owned lands near you is definitely one way. Um, the other thing is maximizing the ecological benefit of your land through planting native species on there, um, moving away from the exotic species which have little wildlife value to, to more native species is another way. Um, supporting uh, any kind of initiatives that uh, improve forest management, regulations for forest management, these things are, anybody can do those whether they, whether they own land or not. Okay, great. Um, uh, someone is asking where they could find um, a chart similar to the one you showed um, with the ecosystem diversity in Southern Illinois. Uh, which chart did I show with the ecosystem diversity? The, um, the I believe it's where you show like the confluence of the oh. main biomes sure so you would look for there's some the charts there you're looking for a map of the physiographic regions of the u.s so that's what that map came from you would find that um just through an internet search and you would there um there's different they're mapped a little differently depending on who did the mapping um but you can they're they're pretty common out there but you're looking for physiographic regions okay um should we uh, should we be cutting out maple from our oak hickory forest you know uh if if your goal is to maintain an oak hickory forest if your goal is to um enhance that part of aspect of of um your forest by and large now in most forest maple is um is kind of would you would want to cut it out uh, i'm also want to make sure that i'm not a maple hater and there's some places where we want to have maple maple are a natural part of our ecosystem they're naturally found, particularly in um, bottomlands and coves, north facing slopes. So I'd want to maintain maple on an ecosystem. But if if you have a plan, you do an inventory, you look at your forest and it, that, that plan indicates that maples are impacting your oaks and you want to maintain oaks, then yes, a lot of times cutting out maple is, is a common practice. Okay, and this is kind of a similar question. You may have already addressed some of it, but um, in Northeastern Illinois, we focus a lot on restoring oak hickory forests through removal of invasives and controlled burns. But it sounds like the natural progression would be more towards the mesic bottomland type forests you mentioned. Are we striving to make something that doesn't really want to exist here anymore? You know, that's a fantastic question. Um, and that's one that people struggle with. Um, as I mentioned, you know, the climate conditions are for more forest. But what I would say is if you look at the history of the forest in Illinois and over the last 10,000 years or so, um, our forests have largely been this oak ecosystem forest. Our communities that have, have developed, our plant species are here, our, our species that thrive in an oak hickory ecosystem. Um, if you look at the anthropogenic use of fire and disturbance over the last 10,000 years, I would argue that that has been a natural and necessary part of our development of our ecosystems. So removing that, those, those influences over the last 100 years, 150 years, 
um, is, in my mind, is a deviation from what has been the natural state of these ecosystems over the last 10,000 years. So um, for me, putting those disturbances back on the landscape does a couple things. One, it, it, it brings us back into what would be considered the natural disturbance regime, the natural systems, the natural influences that our systems developed in. And then two, it's maximizing the conditions to get as much native plant diversity on our landscape and native ecosystem diversity in our landscape as we can. And to me, that's a valuable thing to strive for. Okay, great. Um, actually, I have a question for you, Chris. We have right. quite a few uh, more questions. I didn't know if you wanted to continue for some time or if you want to address those um, maybe to people privately or what, do you, what are your thoughts? Um, let's do a couple more. We're already running over time a little bit. Let's do a couple more and then anything else, um, people are free to email me uh, or we can address some other ways. But um, if we got a couple more questions, let's address them and then I think we need to probably sign off. Okay. Um, so I'll, I'll pick out a couple here. Uh, it seems like some of the stewards have wide latitude to change forests such as cutting down maples and cherries. In general, is this what we are looking for to eliminate trees if they're not right for that particular ecosystem? Um, just wondering about the impact of that given that we need as many trees as possible to mitigate climate change. Yeah, that's a, that's a fair question. You know, again, um, it goes back to the decisions of why they're cutting those trees. Um, and uh, looking at our ecosystems here, which um, by and large in the uplands portions were more open ecosystems had higher plant diversity in the understory and that led to higher wildlife value um, higher forage value higher um, species diversity that that's the decisions that the site stewards are making is to try to bring that back on the landscape if you do look at the total portion of forest that are that that's happening in, it's still a small amount. So overall, I think across the state, our forests are trending towards more mesic species. And if no acres are, if, if nothing's done, that's kind of the direction it's going to be. So by maintaining um, some areas and, and maintaining as much areas as we can um, in this more oak, oak, open oak system, we're just, we're preserving that part of our component of our natural ecosystems. And so I think that to me, again, that's the valuable aspect of, of why we're doing that. Okay. Um, let's see, here's one that um, is interesting. Chicago has an oak ecosystem recovery project. Does downstate have any similar projects? Um, there's a couple things. So that's a good question. So across the whole state, um, there's two documents that really uh, relate to forest management. The first is our state forest action plan. And so that uh, was developed by a large group, but it led by the, the Division of Forestry within the Department of Natural Resources. And that takes a statewide look uh, at forest and forestry across the state and the practices we need to do to maintain healthy forest and a healthy forest industry. The second one is our, our wildlife action plan. So that's the state plan for managing our rare and declining wildlife. Within that plan, they have a campaign that's specific to the forest of Illinois. And so it highlights actions and, and practices that need to happen uh, specifically to address rare and decline, declining wildlife that utilize our forest. So those are documents that apply across the state. Um, really, really good documents. If you're interested in forestry and the direction of forest management, highly recommend, recommend reading both of those. Um, specific to Southern Illinois, um, there is a Southern Illinois, um, I forgot the document, it's called like the vision, uh, vision document or a management document that talks specifically about the ecosystems in the Southern tiers uh, of the state in the Southern 16 counties or so, and then kind of how the management needs to happen there. And all of these, these different documents really um, complement each other. So they're not at odds necessarily at all, um, but they just give different aspects of it. But that's the document that's specific to Southern Illinois. It's still in development. It's at the final phases of being um, edited and will be published hopefully within the next few months. 
Okay, great, Chris. Um, there's been several questions about uh, restating some of the information. Um, just to let everyone know, we'll be recording this and posting it online. Yes, and I will. What I also will do is I'll make a PDF of my presentation handouts, so you'll be able to see my slides. And when we send the note out to everybody with the link to the presentation, I'll also share that PDF of my slides so it'll have all the text there. So everybody will have that. 